Tonight on Brian Ross Investigates, the college admissions scandal. The parents charged today chose to corrupt and illegally manipulate the system for their benefit. Celebrity actors, corporate bosses, wealthy lawyers, all caught in an FBI sting, accused of using bribes to get their children into elite schools they did not merit on their own. I don't really care about school, as you guys all know. A close look at the system that drives wealthy parents to desperate means. In other words, rich people are insane. Once you have that much money, it poisons your brain. Plus, too fancy to fly? Uh, any plane currently in the air will go to its destination and thereafter be grounded until further notice. The brand new 737 airliners banned worldwide after two fatal crashes strikingly similar. Now the question of how U.S. regulators first okayed the new planes and then were among the last to ground them. And our shout out for the intrepid reporter for the Weather Channel who faced hostility from both the drug cartels and U.S. officials to discover what's really behind the thousands of people trying to make their way to the U.S. border. Crops are failing, people are going hungry, and they're coming because they don't have anything to eat. From the Law and Crime Network studios in New York City, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening and welcome. This is the month that hundreds of thousands of high school seniors around the country will be waiting to learn where they may be going to college next fall. It is an agonizing time, making the news of a massive cheating scandal involving college admissions all the more disgusting. $25 million in bribes, some 800 students, and some of the country's best-known colleges. The FBI called it Operation Varsity Blues, leading to the arrests of college coaches, test proctors, and some 33 well-off parents. The parents charged today, despite already being able to give their children every legitimate advantage in the college admissions game, instead chose to corrupt and illegally manipulate the system for their benefit. Among those charged, actor Felicity Hoffman and Lori Laughlin, whose two daughters, prosecutors say, gained admission to USC thanks to $500,000 in bribes paid to the rowing team coach. Her youngest daughter, Olivia Jade, told her followers on this YouTube video how little she cared about going to college. I don't know how much of school I'm going to attend, but I do want the experience of, like, game days, partying. I don't really care about school, as you guys all know. <laughs> the FBI says some of the parents helped arrange bogus photos of their children to make it appear they were athletes so that bribed college coaches could use their slots to get them admitted. In one example, the head women's soccer coach at Yale, in exchange for $400,000, accepted an applicant as a recruit for the Yale women's team, despite knowing that the applicant did not even play competitive soccer. The mastermind, William Singer, has pleaded guilty in the case and apparently worked with the FBI after he was caught to record damaging phone calls with many of the prominent parents. In other words, rich people are insane. <laughs> Once you have that much money, it poisons your brain. You either end up bribing a soccer coach to get your kid into Yale, or if that doesn't work, you leave all your money to your cat. Joining us now in the studio is Eric D. McKaylee, director of admissions at Regis High School in New York, who has worked hard to get hundreds of his students, including my son, into some of the country's top schools. And joining us via Skype from Boulder, Colorado, is Chris Hunt, a journalist and writer who also works as a college essay mentor to high school students through the arduous college admission process. And finally, joining us, USC undergrads Morgan Steffens and Francis Augustine, who are covering the story for their school paper. Let me start with you two. What do you make of all this? Your school seems to be at the center of it. Yeah, um, it's, it's a crazy story, uh, but it's also a really good lesson of journalism on the go. Uh, we're in Washington, D.C. right now, actually, on an academic program uh, with the Annenberg School. And when the story broke, uh, we got right to work. We had just finished a conversation with a congressman, and we immediately started fact-checking, scouring documents, and I think it just showed, uh, you know, the real world of, of how news can be and how uh, once a story breaks, it's, it's really time to get to work. And what do you make of the fact that bribes were able to get some students, apparently, into USC? I mean, I was... I'll be honest, I was rejected out of high school, and um, it, it stung for a while, but I'm obviously not bitter anymore because I go here, 
But I always think to myself, if I had those extra two years before I transferred here um, to seize on opportunities that USC would have provided me, how much farther I could go in my career. And it makes me think that uh, I, feel che I felt cheated and uh, a lot of these students were cheated too. Eric D. McKaylee here in New York. What do you make of this scandal? Uh, these students talk about how they felt cheated by it. Well, I, I think it's just a logical extension of the whole approach to college admissions as a prize to be won. Um, and there are going to be people who are going to, you know, not abide by the rules. I think the more criminal aspect is what's actually legal in college admissions, to be honest. Um, and I, I think that there's a, a high level of cynicism about the process to start with, and this will only exacerbate that level. Had you heard anything about this rumblings that there were people out there who would do these kinds of things, college coaches? You, you know, again, I, I'm principally a teacher and an admissions director for folks coming into Regis, so I would defer to my colleagues in the college admissions process at Regis, particularly our terrific director, He Sun Hong, on, on that. Um, yeah, we live in New York City, so I'm, I'm sure that it's pretty prevalent in terms of that, uh, not so much at a place like Regis, obviously, uh, but I think it distorts the whole approach to education. When someone's sitting in front of you and you're trying to prepare them for the next stage in their life, their focus should be on the inventory of their present skills and their development and thinking logically about what's the next best stage for them to develop those skills, and that should be the focus. Um, it's not like their life is going to be uh, immediately guaranteed if they get into one college or another. It's, it's, it's the hard work of development is still going to have to take place in either instance. But it seems these parents were so intent on getting their children into certain schools, Chris Hutton, Volter. What drives that desperation by these parents, do you think? Well, these particular parents were probably driven by the fact that they felt they didn't have access through the legal but questionable means that most people use. So a lot of people have uh, power and money that they put to use in other ways, uh, such as uh, going to a nice private school. Hiring someone like me is, is an advantage. So when you've run through that process and you still don't have alumni status, athlete status, even at the other end of the spectrum, first in your family to go to college, if someone tempts you with a back door, and apparently that's exactly what this guy did, he would hold this in front of you as an alternative, then some people will be tempted. He called it a back door or a side door. The back door, he said, was when you give money to the school up front, the front door, when you get in under your own auspices. There is a side door, I guess. He, he created the side door. So something I think is a distinction worth making is that the regular admissions process is not being accused here. No one bribed an admissions officer because that person has too many layers and too much scrutiny around them. No admissions officer has the power to say yes. But they went through this athletic process because the coaches, once they say yes, basically have the power to get the person in the admissions office to let them in. So this person was, who committed the crime was very good at probing for the weak point and then finding people who would uh, agree to his terms. We've got a question from the control room, a help me Rhonda moment. Rhonda Schwartz, our executive producer, what's your question? Eric, a question for you. The students whose parents are now charged with this, what about the students? Should they be thrown out of school? Should they be held responsible? I'm not thinking so much about their fate as I am about the youngsters who were displaced in this admissions process. So um, if they're going to stay, and it's very difficult, if, particularly if they were unaware of what their parents were doing, um, I think each of these schools should you know, compensate by adding a few more slots for kids who might have been displaced and to, and to also reevaluate their, their overall admissions process. Um, you know, again, what's legal is even more problematic than what's illegal. This is kind of obviously a, a moral failing, uh, but you know, certainly legacy preference, sports preference and the like, uh, that's the thing that kind of limits the number of slots that are open on a, a competitive and meritocratic basis. Morgan and Francis, how would you answer that question? What should happen to your classmates whose parents apparently paid bribes to get them into USC? Obviously, the, the people who are involved who are already at USC, they're already on their way to getting their diploma. So I don't think there's going to be any way that, uh, that the school can rectify that on, on that end. 
but um, they're going to have to focus more on the new incoming students, which I think is going to just make admissions a lot more challenging in the future. Yeah, I think that even if the students did stay, that, uh, you know, there might be a little bit of backlash between the students that, you know, got in through merit and uh, feel like they don't deserve to be there. Quickly, Mr. D. McKaylee, uh, will this lead to any reforms, you think, this scandal? Um, I think it will to the degree that it highlights um, the, the regular process now and who's squeezed out in that particular process. It also makes uh, poor folks and working class folks and first generation folks very cynical about it. Um, you know, if there's some doubt as whether they deserve to be there, and I'm fully committed to affirmative action, this certainly demonstrates that it's pretty much a rigged game, and I would hate for anyone to sort of disengage from that process uh, because of the, you know, a sort of the cynicism that's engendered by this process. Eric D. McKaylee, Chris Hunt in Boulder, and Morgan and Francis in Washington, thank you all for joining us tonight. Coming up, Too Fancy to Fly, troubling news about the brand new 737. Now to some disturbing news about airline travel, with the grounding of the entire fleet worldwide of a brand new state-of-the-art jetliner, raising the question by some of whether it's too fancy to fly. It's called the 737 MAX, launched with great fanfare by Boeing on its first flight three years ago. Despite the wet weather, the 737 MAX began its first flight as smoothly as expected. But now, in the wake of a second deadly crash of the 737 MAX, the entire fleet worldwide has been grounded. The U.S., whose FAA inspectors had approved the plans for the 737, was among the last countries to order the planes grounded. Pilots have been notified. Uh, airlines have been all notified. Airlines are agreeing with this. The safety of the American people and all people is our paramount concern. At issue is a key modification in the plane's flight system that led the president to say airplanes are becoming far too complex to fly, a statement widely mocked by the late-night comedians. Here's President Trump on the tarmac preparing for his trip abroad. He's declared air travel as too complicated, which is why he'll be flying in the newly designed Air Force One. Of course, what has happened is no laughing matter, and to gain more insight tonight, we're joined by Christine Negroni, author of the book, The Crash Detectives, who's been reporting on the 737 developments this week for the New York Times. Mr. Negroni, thank you for being here. How long do you imagine this entire fleet could be grounded? Well, that is really the million dollar, that is the multi-million dollar question when you think about all of the losses from the airlines and Boeing and everyone else, the insurance companies. But I'm going to say it's not going to be a short grounding. I just don't think it's going to be uh, easy to not only fix the software, which I understand uh, Boeing is well involved in getting a, a modification to the software done, but in actually testing out that software and making sure that in changing to fix one problem, they don't reintroduce or introduce problems that they are unaware of. So it's the testing to make sure that this fix fixes without harming somewhere else that I think is going to take some time. Uh, I, it's anybody's guess, and I don't want to weigh in. I, I'm more likely to be wrong than right, but I don't think it's going to be short. And the core here is a device or software that was designed to be actually a safety feature. Isn't that right? Yes, because when they when the Max was designed, it was actually, they, they changed the engines for more powerful engines, and it changed the way the airplane moves through the air, it changed the, the aerodynamics a bit. And the problem with that was it, ma it tended to make the airplane, uh, it, it made it slightly more likely to stall, and so they put this anti-stall uh, protection software on board the airplane. There were two problems with that. It, they did not realize at the time that if there was a, a, a faulty angle of attack, 
track indicator that it might actually force the airplane into a, into a dive when it was not required. And second, and, and probably the larger problem, that pilots were not notified of this change, and so that pilots who were not uh, steeply uh, trained in the 737 might be unaware that to take the power off the the trim the the trim control they might actually fix it and so the pilots in the Lion Air case we believe it's all very initial that they were struggling with the airplane without doing what they should have done to get the power you know to get the power off the the tail the flight control surfaces on the tail so you know it's a matter of training it's a matter of you know unexpected problems on the on the airplane pilots trusting a brand new airplane over their own piloting skills you can certainly understand that so there's a lot of components like every aircraft uh, air, air accident there's a lot of factors that go into it and yet mr groney this was a system approved by the faa and the faa was among the last countries if not the last uh, agency to sort of ground these airplanes what's going on here are they just too cozy with the airline industry with boeing I've heard that, but I don't really think that was a factor here, or made it a factor, but I don't think it was the primary factor. Look, aviation relies on data. They want to see data before they make a decision. And there was not data coming out of Ethiopia, and that is a problem. I mean, I put some of the culpability on this delay and this crazy, crazy grounding here, patchwork of groundings. I put some of the culpability there on Ethiopia for not getting those black boxes somewhere earlier. They sat on them for two and a half days. There was no reason for that. And also that there is information available. We know because the Canadians already told us that there was information available from the satellite uh, data that came off the airplane that showed more likely than they originally thought that this was related to the crash in Lion Air. But why did it, why was there two days before the information came back to the Canadians and to the and to the FAA? So while people are saying, oh, the FAA is too cozy with Boeing, I don't really think it's that. I think the FAA was waiting for data. Meanwhile, other countries were listening to what passengers were saying, which is, we're worried. And they responded to that. And that's a legitimate, you know, that's a legitimate issue also. You don't want the traveling public to be frightened by getting on an airplane. It's another component in the decision making. Well, Christine Negroni, thank you very much for being here tonight. We look forward to your future reporting in the New York Times. Coming up, our shout out for the reporter who braved hostility on both sides of the border to get an important story. Our shout out tonight for a brave reporter who has had to find ways to work around two powerful groups that don't want him to tell the story of what's happening along the U.S. border. The brutal Mexican drug cartels on one side and antagonistic U.S. officials on the other. Uh, my name is John Carlos Frey and I am an independent investigative reporter. I would be uh, probably naive to say that it's not a dangerous place. I have been held at gunpoint several times. I have been threatened with my life on several occasions. I have been um, held against my will for a few days. But listen, I'm a, I'm a reporter, and I work in what some people would call uh, a war zone, and that's just part of the job. Last week, it was reported that the U.S. government had kept a list of reporters who were targeted to be stopped if they came across the border. To my knowledge, I wasn't on the list. Uh, the last time I tried to get into the United States, I was in Central America and uh, booked a flight back to Los Angeles, and I was held in customs for five hours without any information as to why. I'm pretty sure that, that all of my luggage, as well as my laptop, was gone through pretty meticulously. So I'm assuming that if I'm not on the list, I'm being watched. I'm catching up with the caravan once they've already been on the road for a month, traveled almost a 1,000 miles, and are arriving in Mexico City. 
Frey essentially in bedded with one of the so-called caravans as hundreds traveled from Central America, making their way to the U.S. border, leading President Trump to declare a national emergency. We're talking about an invasion of our country with drugs, with human traffickers, with all types of criminals and gangs. But for a special report that aired on the Weather Channel, Exodus, The Hunger That Consumes You, Frey uncovered a surprising, much different angle to the story. I find a lot of people who worked on farms and say that they fled because of the drought. Mira, la cosa, uh, hubo mucha sequía. Hubo mucha sequía, las milpas, la, la mazorquita es pequeña. Ya no va a salir, mira. Esto todo está perdido. Está perdido. Todo eso está perdido. One of the major reasons that people are coming up is because of climate change, of all things. People are hungry. They are experiencing a drought in Central America that's gone on for now close to five years. Crops are failing. People are going hungry, and they're coming because they don't have anything to eat. Uh, that's something that doesn't seem to be reported on, that people are knocking on the U.S. door because they're hungry. Yo creo que no hay un lugar donde te sientas más cómodo que en tu tierra. Pero igual cuando ya sientes el hambre, que el hambre ya te, te trae encima, que tal vez tus hijos te están exigiendo, papá, quiero comer de tal cosa, quiero comer comida buena, quiero comer carne. Entonces es ahí donde te llenas de coraje y dices, me voy. His Weather Channel report with lead producer Sally Granitstein documented the accounts of the families trying to get to the U.S., backed up with experts on meteorology and famine, a story largely untold in other media outlets. Just last month, the United Nations declared that 2.1 million people have reached a type of famine status compared to 400,000 people the year before. I uh, hooked up with the Weather Channel, who was interested in reporting this from a climate perspective. But the fact that millions of people may be suffering from famine in the next year or two, I don't see a lot of reporting. Which for Frey and his team is reason enough to brave the dangers in Mexico and the official hostility on the U.S. side to stay on the story, finding a way to get his reporting out, even without the big budgets and resources of the mainstream media. Uh, we don't have a satellite truck, and we don't have a lot of complicated ways of broadcast, so we just do a Facebook Live report, and that's how we've been getting that information out, which seems to be received pretty well. Uh, the, the stories are still there, so I have a job to do. So our shout-out tonight to John Carlos Fry, a reporter who continues to go where few others do. That's our program for tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you back here next week.